There are four items that I need to knit in order to finish the capsule wardrobe that is suggested in this lovely knitting pattern book. Last time we finished the first one, which is this lovely classic red sweater that I'm wearing right now. So we have three to go to complete the entire rest of the capsule wardrobe. Today we're going to be working on making this skirt because it poses a few interesting challenges on making it on my knitting machine versus knitting it by hand. To make my size, which is slightly tight for my measurements, I'm probably going to add a few more stitches here and there, I would have to cast on 464 stitches in fingering weight yarn. <laughs> that would be quite the project and I don't know that I would finish it this year or even next if I did that fully hand knit. And speaking of hand knit, I think that we came to kind of an agreement that while something knit on the machine is not hand knit, it is still handmade, kind of similar to how the sewing machine works. If you hand sew something, that is different than hand making something with a sewing machine. So I can still call my knits handmade, but they are not hand knit because I didn't knit each one of the stitches by hand with my knitting needles. Coming back to the skirt pattern, which this book calls the swing pattern. Last time we did the mazurka and I tried to use some music that kind of sounded like a mazurka. I have actually danced the mazurka once in my life at a Victorian ball. That was really fun. And I did used to do swing dancing. So this is kind of fun. I feel like I have to learn how to polka dance and I have to learn how to dance the mashish. We'll have to see. <laughs> the kind of technical aspect of knitting the skirt pattern on my knitting machine is the fact that it has a subtle zigzag to it and that is produced by having stockinette as the background stitches and then the zigzag is in moss stitch or seed stitch which is alternating knit and purls on the knitting machine that i have i would have to manually manipulate each and every stitch every single time along with doing all the decreases be faster than doing it by hand but still take quite a long time so i first want to see if there's a different way that i can introduce a pattern to my skirt rather than just having it be a plain stock in it fabric and on a quick side note the yarn that i used for this is once again an unraveled sweater that I unraveled using my unraveler. It is cashmere, but because I want the skirt and the vest to match, couldn't really find enough yarn from just one sweater to make up the whole piece. If I were to just use one yarn from one sweater, I couldn't double it up. And the cashmere yarn is so, so fine. I at least need to double it. There's some complications around the way that I decided to double up the yarn from two separate sweaters to knit this one. So let's jump right into some exploration of what we can do and how we can really, really realistically knit up this skirt while keeping in mind that I also have to knit up a matching vest to go with it. So we've established that moss stitch or seed stitch or anything like that is a little bit difficult to do with my machine and the setup that I have. However, I did find... Where is it? Is it this one? Is this one? Hold up. No. It's this one. Here we go. This book lost its cover, so I don't know what it's from. I think it's from one of my ribbers. And we have a pattern called the Variation Swing. I want to make up a sample of this just to learn how to do it, number one. And number two, I want to see what the other side of this fabric looks like because I have an inkling that I want to use the other side as my right side of the fabric, the fabric that you see. So I'm going to go study this table because it's a little complicated. And then let's try to make a sample swatch. I thought it was quite interesting how this swing rib worked, so I wanted to show it to you in a little bit more detail. On the left hand side of my knitting bed, I have a little swing arm that I can use to control the relative position of the river bed that you can see moving here to the main knitting machine. So this is the swing arm and I can turn that in the different directions to move the river bed left and right and that then creates a zigzag pattern as I continue to move it back and forth as I'm knitting more rows which is kind of fun I think. Okay I am really proud of this sample. Look at this! Okay, down here, I had made the mistake where I wasn't knitting with all of the needles on the knitting bed machine, so I needed to engage all of the needles on the knitting bed. Then when I did that, that is when the pattern really came out. So I think that looks really cool. The only thing is I had mentioned that I wanted to see the other side of the pattern and it shows up pretty well on camera that there's like a tension difference, but it's not fully a pattern. In real life, it just looks like did you knit that slightly unevenly? <laughs> I don't think there's a way to change that. Other thing that I was considering, there is a pattern in the book called the herringbone swing. 
which could be another contender, but it's a tuck and swing. This swing wasn't too bad. I've tried tuck patterns before though, and they've always just clogged up my machine. So let me read through the graph on this one and maybe I can try it out if I can even get it to work. So I'm gonna read it and let's see what, what, what it says really. You can see it from the video and the way that I'm operating my machine and the carriage, but it is just so tight to try to get my carriage across the stitches. And it got to a point where, as you can see here, I can't, I could not move the carriage anymore. The tuck action just does not play well on my machine. Okay, so I wasn't doing the swing portion of this correctly. I should have gone in one direction for longer because you can kind of see how in this test sample, it's just like zigzagging back and forth immediately and I should have just kept on going like I did for the other one but it was so hard to knit and I thought it would give a really solid fabric because I was knitting at such a high tension and it was so hard to get the needles across but it's actually super open this it almost looks like I laddered my stitches in between it's just a bit too see-through for me so I'm going to do this fabric so now that I have that done, I guess the next thing usually at this point would be to do a gauge swatch, but I, I think actually I need to make sure that I have enough yarn. So the pattern originally calls for this vintage yarn. Like a lot of vintage patterns, it doesn't list the yarn requirements in yards. It lists it in ounces or skeins of that particular wool. <laughs> I was able to look at that wool and I found it on Ravelry. Some people have it in their stashes and one person, oh, thank you to this person, weighed out and measured how many yards of yarn there are in each one of the skeins, which meant that I was able to go back and calculate how many yards of yarn I would need to make this pattern. Now I need to do the largest size that they have written and some bits of it I might even need to make a little bit larger. So I calculated that I didn't need this many yards yards of yarn which is quite a lot. I would like to use some of my unraveled sweaters for this so I'm gonna go cake up some of those yarn balls. There's a few ways that you can determine how many yards of yarn you have for a yarn that it doesn't have it designated. I have a yarn counter so I can just run my yarn to the yarn counter and it'll count it for me. Let's go do that and let's see how many I have and if I have enough. As the color that is suggested for this skirt and vest is a poplar green, I ran the three or four green sweaters that I had unraveled so far through my yarn counter and it turns out that I just didn't have enough of any one in particular that I could at least double up to make a wearable garment. So I knew that I would have to knit with two separate colors together in order to get enough yardage, hopefully, maybe, to make both that match. Ideally, I would have plied the two yarns together before for knitting with them because when you don't do that you end up potentially with some stripes. This is purposeful striping. I was testing out ways to make the yarn stretch a little bit further in this sample but even in making my gauge swatch I wasn't so worried because when I made the gauge swatch out of the two separate colors it didn't show up so much the striping effect and it turns out that I should have maybe been a little bit more worried because while I am very happy throughout this video and my vest making video the striping is quite obvious and look Looking back on it now, I wish that I would have taken the time to at least lightly ply it together or there's a video by Knitology one by one where you can use two different colors of yarn but force one to be in the front all the time and one to be behind. So I wish I would have learned how to do at least one of those things but well you'll see kind of the interesting zebra stripes that my yarn and pieces end up taking in this video. <laughs> Last night, I already made a start on my skirt. I'm sorry I didn't show you. It was really dark. And also, I was kind of in a grumpy mood, and I don't think anyone wants to see that, to be honest. But I'm happier today because I have one third of the skirt complete. I haven't explained why I only did one third of my skirt, and that is because in the beginning, I did mention that you have to cast on over 400 stitches to get the full circumference at the bottom of the skirt in order to make the size that will fit me. And well, my knitting machine is not 500 needles wide. I have about 200 needles, but the needles on the very ends of my machine are quite bent. So I rather than kind of playing with fire and doing half of the skirt, so two skirt panels, I decided to make three skirt panels. So I split the width of the skirt into three and knit 
three separate panels that I would then have to seam up to make the full skirt pattern. Now this does look maybe a little see-through, but I will be wearing this skirt with a slip underneath it. So I did use two yarns together. I'm wondering, yeah, can you kind of see that striping, subtle striping that's happening? I think like you can definitely see that it's a thing, but it looks random enough that it doesn't look planned. I mean, it's not planned because I'm just holding two threads of different yarn types together. I had a lot of trouble at the beginning. This is this is definitely gonna be a panel for the back because no one wants to know anything about the back. So one of the threads snapped here. You can kind of see that it's lighter. Um, so it's bulging out. Hopefully that will block out. I have quite a few runs that I have to fix. So this is a, a pearl row. This is a run. I guess I also never decided to explain why I didn't do the swing rib. And the main reason is that, like I stated before, I started this late at night when I was not in the best mood. So I wanted to do something that was a little bit easier on my brain. And rather than do just plain stockinette, I decided to do a stockinette stitch skirt with pearl ribs that run down it and there is inspiration that I took from some other 40s patterns that are very very similar. I just didn't want to do the extra mental math of the swing rib and I thought it looked a little bit more 90s than 1940s if that makes sense and I'm sorry I wasn't clear about that before. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a few of those. The left side of my bed was kind of a curse last night. Holding it up, it does seem small, but I'm hoping that it's because a stockinette always curls. So I'm hoping that's why it seems small, <laughs> not because it's too small. Oh boy. I was debating on whether I should like fix the mistakes in this one or just go to the next panel. I'm thinking I'll go to the next panel because while I did read up the pattern, they were and I made the notes for myself with some of the changes that I made last night from the pattern versus what I did on the machine. It's just, it's fresh right now, so I'd rather go make the other two skirt panels and then I can go to the, like the assembly and mending portion of the skirt. Did I say I'm really happy with this? Because I am. It's gonna wear super well, I think. Hopefully. Hopefully. Panel number two is off the machine. I feel like I had different troubles with it this time. Last time it was the left side of the machine bed that was giving me issues, this time it was the right. Now I have this like ripped end, so I'm gonna save that. I also wasn't concentrating as closely as I could have because as you might hear in the background, we are dog sitting a friend's dog and he is the best kind of distraction. <laughs> and if you think that there were dog noises in the background before, just wait until you hear the two of them. Oh yes, yes. So the other issues besides that ripped bit is I uh, accidentally forgot to move some of the stitches towards the end here. 
So these should have been decreases, and instead I created eyelets. But I'm just gonna sew those closed. It means I ended up with a few extra stitches, but with a skirt, that's never really a bad thing in my opinion. I did replace some of the needles on the right side of the bed from the last time that I was knitting on this because I noticed that they were stuck. I thought I had gotten all of the ones with stuck latches or bent latches, but I have felt a few more. So before I cast on my last one, I think I might go through the, all the needles again and replace any that aren't working. Let's do that. And then I will see you, I guess, for the third panel cast on. With an older knitting machine that is in the condition mine's in, you do have to be a little bit comfortable working with it. So here I am removing the sponge bar as far as I need it to in order to access the needles that are broken that I need to remove. The sponge bar puts tension on the needles, so this needs to be removed so that I can get the needles in and out. And once the needles are replaced with working ones, I just kind of cannibalize the working ones from the end of my machine so I have fewer and fewer needles as time goes by. I put the sponge bar back in place and I am back to knitting on my third and final panel. Number three is off the machine. It has the least amount of mistakes. Not no mistakes. I did catch one stitch, so I have an extra loop here, and then there is one extra eyelet here that I have to sew up, but we don't have any rips at the bottom of the hem. To the main components of this skirt are finished. The next thing that I have to do is I'm going to fix all of the, like, urgent mistakes that I have on my other two panels, the ones where there's rips and runs. I need to stabilize it so it doesn't get worse. So I'm gonna do that and then I will see you again when we sew up all the panels and we make some decisions about how we're going to construct this skirt. So I will see you probably in a few days because it's gonna take me a while. And here are the first two skirt panels sewn together, but I am pointing out the seam here so you can see it a little bit more on the wrong side where the seam goes. I do think that the seam works really well and it's pretty invisible. I don't think you could tell if it were a more cohesive fabric, but because of the striping that happened, you can see it a little bit. It's called the blind stitch and I'm sure there's lots of tutorials online, but I found this one in one of my knitting machine books. So that's the one that I followed and I just attached the third panel as you can see me doing here it was good because these are very long seams to roughly pin in place where I was aiming for on each one and it's pretty satisfying to kind of loosely stitch for a while because you want to make sure that your tension's even so then you pull it up and together and then that's how you can make sure that your tension is really nice between those two panels and I think that that lended to a really clean seam I did end up putting in a zipper in my skirt because I just wasn't sure that I'd be able to get it over over my hips and then fit my waist as well. I used this vintage zipper that I had that was in the absolute perfect color. And I also added two rows of single crochet to the bottom like the instructions said. I blocked it out by ironing it and it was fully ready for me to share with you. these knits and the footage of the knits a few weeks out from when I created them and I'm looking at them in a slightly different light. I am still really happy that I was able to create this skirt and how soft it is. I mean it is cashmere so it's wonderful but I am pretty disappointed now looking back on it on the striping effect from the yarns. Like I said I wish I would have done one of two things to either marl the yarn or minimize the effect of the striping but I am really happy that I do have a wearable and 
I think still pretty cute skirt. I don't know, what do you think? Also, I'm so sorry that I randomly switched what pattern I was doing for the skirt midway through. This was a little bit helter skelter, maybe as you can tell. I do hope that you enjoyed watching this. If you like this, feel free to subscribe because you'll see another video about the 1940s knit capsule wardrobe really, really soon. Thank you again, bye. Kind of tedious to do with my sheen. <laughs> My sheen. My machine. <laughs> You're helping me prepare. <laughs> Making sure my chair is fluffy. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much.